my name is Chris Harwood and I'm co-director of the Central European Center at the Harriman Institute. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you today uh, to the launch of a five part uh, series we're going to have. Uh, I'll just say a few things in, about the series in general and I'll turn it over to my co-director, uh, Alexander Boskovic, who will introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, but as I say, this is the first installment um, uh, out of five. We're going to uh, uh, be starting today, then we'll have a little bit of a break uh, and resume on March 16th. Uh, and it's going to be fast and furious from that point on. It's going to be one every week after that. Uh, so uh, please uh, uh, plan to be with us uh, on Tuesday afternoons. Uh, in March um, and early April, we will get the last uh, installment will be April 6th. And um, you know, each of, uh, each of the, the talks in this webinar series is going to be uh, investigating some, some aspect of uh, avant-garde art from East Central Europe uh, that has been uh, neglected uh, to a, a greater or lesser extent uh, until now. So I'm very excited about um, this series, I expect to learn a lot uh, uh, about uh, things that I knew only a little about before. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the presentations and the discussions uh, as well, because I believe uh, most of our presenters will be uh, present uh, uh, in the audience uh, and um, will be able to uh, provide uh, some more um, uh, well-informed feedback and, and questions uh, for these talks as we go along. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Alexander Boskovic, would you like to take over? Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for this introduction. <clears throat> I'm also excited about the series we have and um, we're really um, honored to introduce um, our uh, today's speaker who is uh, first in the series. Uh, it is uh, Alexandra Kiriak, uh, who is an art historian specializing in marginalized histories of the 20th century modernism uh, with a focus on identity, gender, and ethnic minorities. Currently, Alexandra is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Modern Art um, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, although she's not in the city, but she's actively uh, involved in the um, uh, lectures and meetings uh, at uh, uh, her um, um, institution and she's there working on a book project that explores urban modernity in interwar Bucharest through the means of design and visual culture and she also traces the city's networks to connectivity to Paris and New York. Um, her peer review publications examined also aspects of Romanian, Soviet and Jewish design and performance history um, and she holds a PhD from the University of St. Andrews and her research has been supported by numerous grants, including an award from the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, from 2015 to 2019. Uh, prior to her graduate studies, uh, Kiriak worked at Sotheby's and co-curated exhibitions at GRAD, a nonprofit cultural platform for Russian and Eastern European art based in London. Um, today, she will um, talk about um, Romanian avant-garde, of course, um, and her title of her um, lecture is Of the Page in Search of the Romanian Avant-Garde Outside Its Publications. Um, Alexandra, welcome. Hi, um, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for inviting me to take part in the series. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to be to go first and to kick up this, uh, the lecture series. Um, I'm going to share my screen, but I have to tell you all that it's 11 p.m. in Bucharest and I've had a lot of coffee. So hopefully I'll be um, you know, very awake for the for the uh, question and answer parts of the session as well. <laughs> okay, here we go. Now I hope you can see the, the slide, the first slide of my presentation. Great. In March 1925, the very first issue of the Romanian avant-garde magazine Integral announced. The group Integral, which does not have the means at present to manifest itself independently and on its own terrain, is undertaking its first theatrical experiment at the Central Theatre of the Vilna Troupe with a production of Soul by André Gide. 
with decor and costumes by MH Maxi. The event must be emphasized. These are the first scenic constructions in our country. The following month, the second issue of the magazine printed three images relating to the play. These were Max Hem and Maxi's designs for six costumes and for the set. The set was fashioned from interconnected, interconnected geometric elements grouped around a multi-level platform that was perhaps intended to form a mechanized assemblage. The geometric rigidity of the set was mirrored by the costume compositions, also seemingly assembled from interchangeable parts and perhaps not entirely human. These do not appear to be practical designs. The figures even lack sections of various limbs, as much as pictorial representations of a mechanical union between actor and stage and a rejection of theatrical naturalism. Accompanying these images was an article, also by Maxi, on modernism in theatre in France, Germany and Russia. But of the production itself, there was no mention in Integral or any other avant-garde journal of this period. I was intrigued by the idea of this experimental production taking place in Bucharest, and so I, I wanted to find out more about it, especially as scholarly accounts of the Romanian avant-garde did not give any more detail than I could find in Integral itself. But the general assumption in scholarship was that this production had taken place. I found several of Maxi's theatre designs in the collections of the Romanian National Art Museum and the Romanian Academy. And so some of these um, were for the play for Saul and others were for different, um, different plays, which I'm showing you here. But what I noticed was that they, all of these designs were prepared on the same type of paper and in the same style. Uh, they are signed and dated and contain information about the productions that they represent. They are highly finished and do not appear to be working sketches. It seems likely uh, to me that they are later recreations of working designs, perhaps for an exhibition despite being dated with the actual year of the individual production. Such a possibility is all the more plausible as the art historian Irina Karabash has found further instances of Maxi altering or recreating earlier works, probably for a retrospective that took place in 1965, which was a major event in Bucharest, especially as Maxi was by then the director of the Romanian National Art Museum. And so I think it seems very likely that the stage designs were recreated for the purpose of this event. Um, I could not find them in Max's previous exhibitions until the retrospective in 1965. So um, although I found these sketches, they did not bring me any closer to the production itself, but on the contrary, to some misgivings as to how avant-garde narratives are created, sometimes by the protagonists themselves and sometimes by the exclusionary nature of avant-garde scholarship or the way in which we think about avant-garde practices. And I know that much has been written about this topic already, and perhaps we will return to this in the discussion, but for the sake of brevity, I will quote here just one example that I find particularly candid in its assessment. In an essay published in the book series of the European Network for Avant-Garde and Modernism Studies, David Ayres suggests that, and I quote, many branches of scholarly work are still in the grip of an idealism around the notion of art. And in particular, Ayers discusses how the creation of an autonomous category of the modernist little magazine, which has been studied as separate from a wider public sphere, has caused what he calls, and I quote, an inevitable distortion. Artists in Bucharest produced a wide array of such avant-garde periodicals during the 1920s and 1930s, and they have been widely researched and studied. Maxi's presence looms large in many of these accounts and his reputation rests on the information available in these publications. I'm showing you here um, just a small selection and I picked the ones where you can see Maxi's um, own work on the cover um, of the magazines. And we have um, some of his design objects, uh, painting and also some graphic, um, graphic work. And based on, this, on information from these avant-garde magazines, he has been credited not only with introducing constructivist stage design in Romania, but also with creating a Bauhaus-like design institution in Bucharest in the mid-1920s. And um, in this talk, what I want to do is to highlight a number of the distortions, to borrow the term that Ayers used, um, that this over-reliance on the Romanian avant-garde's own publications and their own narratives have produced. And I would like to show you what happened and why. Um, when I widened the scope of my research. And to do this, I'm going to tell you a bit about my experiences during the research process. And this is something that I, I think we should talk about uh, more as scholars. So now let's return to this uh, phantom production of Saul, 
Um, what Maxi and the Integral Group failed to mention is that they were not really at the forefront of this particular initiative. And the initiator was a man who's almost always absent from accounts of the Romanian avant-garde. Jakob Sternberg was a poet and writer born in Bassarabia. And in my view, he was also one of the most exciting theatre directors in Romania during his time in the country between 1913 and the late 1930s. Sternberg combined his knowledge of the traditions of Yiddish theatre with an interest in popular culture, as well as a thorough understanding of contemporary theatrical development. He struck up a partnership with the Vilna Troupe, a theatrical ensemble formed in Vilnius in 1915, who forged an international reputation due to their innovative Yiddish language productions. The troupe arrived in Romania in 1923 and remained in the country until 1927 engendering a period of exceptionally rich theatrical experimentation. Sternberg's own desire was to create a permanent presence for Yiddish theatre in Romania, and in becoming the artistic director of the troupe, he put this plan into motion. At the Romanian National Archives, I, I found ample documentation submitted by Sternberg to the authorities in order to obtain permits for the troupe to perform, and also pleading uh, the case for funding and support for a permanent Jewish theatre. And this is where I found this 1925 program for the troupe, which evidently doubled as a sort of manifesto for Sternberg to outline his artistic goals. In the text, he wrote, the theatrical productions of the Vilna troupe have revealed to us an unexpected path. It is possible to offer simultaneously to the masses and to the intelligentsia, a cultural institution that meets their preferences without succumbing at all to vulgar instincts. We are ready to not only platonically accept this idea, but to realize it through practical means. An artistic committee will select the repertoire and their ideal will be to offer performances of pure art, the stage turned into a pulpit. It will be an avant-garde theater, a theater of synthesis, which will aim to imbue acting, direction and text with a rhythm of contemporary innovation. To achieve these goals, Sternberg called upon the local avant-garde to support him and revealed that several collaborators had already enlisted, including Maxi. Although Saul was listed amongst the proposed repertoire, it seems not to have made the cut. I thoroughly checked the culture of press of the period and it is evident that it did not take place. Bill Nutri Productions drew much attention and both Romanian and Jewish newspapers kept track of the troops' activities and reviewed their latest offerings. Instead of Saul, it seems that Sternberg chose to direct the Vilna troupe in what he called a synthetic production of Nikolai Gogol's 1842 play, Marriage. He turned this occasion into another manifesto. In the program notes, he wrote at length about his own concept of synthetic theater, which took its cue from the innovations of Alexander Tyrov and Vsevolod Meyerhold in the Soviet Union. Reflecting contemporary discourses about avant-garde theater, Sternberg called for an integration of various artistic forms, including those that were considered lowbrow. He wrote, um, synthetic theater rising on the wings of fantasy towards its pure abstract vision, thus becomes the quintessence of all types of pure theater after the music hall review, restoring the essence of the circus, the ancient theatrical myth, the mystery, the pantomime. Together with the theater designer, George Leuvendal, Sternberg turned marriage into an extravagant spectacle. Masked anthropomorphic characters stalked the stage or dangled above it, tethered from ropes, while others stood inside frames pretending to be paintings come to life. And I particularly enjoyed this description of the performance by a very irate reviewer who said, last night synthetic theater was understood by no one because it is absurd to do away with actors, to do away with walls, to do away with doors in order to introduce characters to chimneys or flying trapezes and to do away with furniture in order to replace it with ropes. This type of staging suppresses both the importance of the word and of the human expression, replacing them by gesture, mask and color. The cubist mask, the mask presented in profile, the facial triangle covered by a layer of green, red, lilac, paint. But in avant-garde periodicals, marriage makes only the briefest of appearances. A short review in Integral um, does not even mention the designer Leuventhal, perhaps because Maxi viewed him as a rival, having not been invited to design this production. Integral's anonymous reviewer um, does defend Sternberg's production from the critics, but also casts doubt on its avant-garde status, in particular due to his choice of a 19th century text. 
This shows how professional rivalries could lead to a less prominent presence in avant-garde publications and eventually in scholarship on the topic, as was the case with Sternberg. Furthermore, um, what may also be um, at fault here is the perception of Yiddish theater as being um, so it's incompatible, so to speak, with a certain national narrative that often privileges the links of the Romanian avant-garde with French culture, for example. Um, a lot has been written about the francophone nature of Romanian art and literature um, and about the avant-garde artists who relocated to France, of which there were several, even those who spent very little time in Romania. And by contrast, Sternberg, who was active in Romania for more than two decades, is rarely mentioned, despite his distinctive productions, which grew increasingly experimental, and his prominence as a social and political activist as well, um, which is also very interesting, so maybe we can talk about that um, later on. And after the Vilna troops' departure in 1927, Sandberg joined forces uh, with another very interesting um, avant-garde um, um, artist, Dida Solomon Kalimaki, and she was an actor whose fame rested on her 1922 debut as a titular character in Strindberg's Miss Julie um, at the National Theatre in Bucharest. Uh, Solomon was a close collaborator and friend of the Bucharest avant-garde, yet she is rarely mentioned in this context, being considered primarily their muse the subject of portraits by Victor Brauner or Marce Lianco or Milica Petrasco. She is sometimes present in avant-garde periodicals, which gives us a glimpse of her diverse artistic practice. For example, um, here she is um, in the catalogue of the 1924 um, exhibition organized by the Contemporano Group in Bucharest, and this was a landmark exhibition. It was the first international show of avant-garde art in Romania's capital. Uh, bringing together participants from eight different countries and included, for example, Lajos Kashak and Karel Tiger, Kurt Schwitters, and many others. Uh, from the list of exhibits, all we know is that Solomon exhibited three dolls, but no further details are given. She is listed next to a section called Asian and Salinese art, which lists items such as idols and masks without mentioning their makeup. Solomon and the anonymous artists hover on the margins of the avant-garde as purveyors of a quote-unquote instinctive primitive aesthetic, which is not quite art, perhaps. Even her husband, the writer Skalat Kalimaki, wrote about the exhibition. Dida Solomon exhibits her uncanny dolls captured from some charming territory in her rich subconscious, naive, free, and colorful verve. These words appeared in the avant-garde periodical Punkt which ran between 1924 and 1925 and was edited by um, Scarlatt Kalimaki, Solomon's husband. It is unclear at the moment, to, uh, at present, to what extent Solomon actually engaged with the magazine. Um, it's possible that she had played a large part in, in editing and founding it, but um, information is too scarce to corroborate this at, at present. Um, but in my view, her most important contribution to the avant-garde was in the theatrical realm. In 1927, uh, she took the initiative of setting up her own organization, which she named the Caragiale Theater, after a prominent 19th century Romanian dramaturge. From the very beginning, she drew her collaborators from the ranks of the avant-garde. Her team included the architect Marcel Iancu, who undertook the refurbishment of the auditorium and the stage, uh, directors Sandu Eliad and Jakob Sternberg, and M.H. Maxi as stage designer. As uh, yet, I could find no photographs of the productions and hardly any archival material, uh, but I tried to piece together the short life of the Caragiale Theatre from newspaper reports and, and reviews. Um, and I also found uh, some documents in the National Archives, which led me to believe that the letterhead, uh, the very lovely letterhead of the, of the theatre had been designed by Max, especially for Dida Solomon. The troupe's first production featured Eliad as director and Yanko as designer. The stylized stage sets with doorless thresholds and ceilingless rooms, as one reviewer described it, were considered too shocking and the production, a contemporary political satire by a Romanian playwright, flopped. Many years later, Eliad recalled the subversive intentions of this production called The Minister, which probably led to its downfall. Eliad's original ideas for the set quoted political controversy through a veiled critique of Romania's governing classes, but the author of the play feared the production would be censored. The final design did not, however, underplay the theatre's artistic ambitions, presenting a sparse stage set, as well as referencing the freeze frame potential of modern photography. Eliad recalled, 
Together with the architect Marcellianco, I created a fixed structure crowned by slogans, which framed a series of alternating background panels that set the scene. Critics at the time found this too modernist. The panels had only empty spaces in the place of windows and doors, and the actors paused at certain moments as if their actions were being captured by the camera lens. After this, another controversial production was August Strindberg's Comrades, uh, for which Solomon collaborated with Sternberg and Maxi. Some of the critics' hostility was directed towards Sternberg's theatrical approach, as they recalled his peculiar, peculiar, in their view, staging of Gogol's marriage with the Vilna troupe. For Comrades, Sternberg toned down his vision, yet reviewers still objected to the minimalist wooden slats that constituted the set's background, whose permeability threatened the audience's suspension of disbelief. Savaged by critics, the play did not survive for more than a handful of performances, despite Sternberg's direction being described by Solomon in her memoirs as moving and masterful. By now, the troupe's financial situation was so dire that one morning the cashier had barely enough change for Sternberg to buy a cup of tea. A new production was needed, and Solomon chose French dramatist Henri René Lenormand's The Failures, a 1920 play about struggling artists, ironically. This production was directed by Eliad and designed by Maxi, who had to contend with some technical difficulties. The play required 11 scene changes, but the Caragiale Theatre lacked the mechanical wherewithal and the backstage space that would allow seamless interchanges. The solution, perhaps inspired by Frederick Kiesler's mechanical stage scenery, was a stage set composed from a small number of stylized architectural elements that could be easily manipulated between scene changes. And it's a shame that we don't have any images of what this actually looked like at the moment, but who knows. Um, and um, it was this production that actually was the theatre's much needed first success. But despite this, Solomon's vision for a more audacious Romanian theatre did not survive beyond its opening season in 1927. The debts incurred during the disastrous first two months could not be met, and Solomon and her husband were faced with multiple legal actions and even the threat of their home being repossessed. Thus, the potential of a homegrown initiative that gathered together Bucharest avant-garde theatre proponents was never fulfilled. Amongst Solomon's plans that never came to fruition was a collaboration with expressionist director Karl Heinz Martin and a production of Sholem Asher's scandalous play The God of Vengeance, which had been censored in the US and in the UK. Um, so this was Dida Solomon, but of course she was not the only woman whose contribution to the Romanian avant-garde has been neglected, and I want to speak about one more. And this is Anna Melania Maxi, known as Mela, who was married to um, the artist Max Eman Maxi, um, whom I mentioned, and who had, a, like I said, a, a very long and successful career, even becoming the director of the National Art Museum after the Second World War. And it would not be an overstatement to say that Mela was driving force behind this career, orchestrating many opportunities and encounters. Her most significant achievement in my view was to open the first commercial space for modern design in Bucharest. And this was an extension of the Academy of Decorative Arts, Bucharest's first school of modern applied arts and design, which had opened in 1924. And this was a private, uh, privately funded initiative. Between 1926 and 1929, the Academy's showroom and the Mellon's leadership exhibited and sold modern decorative arts, as well as paintings, sculpture, and graphic works. Notable collaborators included the designer Andrei Vespremia, also the Academy's creator, who produced multifunctional metal lamps and geometric vases, as well as prominent avant-garde artist Victor Browner, who contributed paintings and graphic works, and Hans Mattis Teutsch, um, whose abstract wooden sculptures were very highly sought after. And the Academy's clients included numerous local collectors interested in the new modern style. Um, Image Maxi also exhibited his own works here, his cubist paintings and art deco textiles and furniture. And he was considered for a long time to be the mastermind behind the space. Um, the reason for that is that adverts for the Academy actually credited the design of the space to him. Um, and um, an image of the exhibition, which graced the cover of, of Integral, bore the caption Modern Interior by M.H. Maxi. 
However, um, my findings have confirmed that actually it was Mela who owned um, finance and managed the business, as well as having an important role in selecting the range of pieces exhibited in the showroom. And in particular, um, I found in a private collection a handwritten agreement dated uh, 1st of September 1926. And here, um, uh, one can see that there was um, an association. Uh, this is a basically a legal document that sets out an association between uh, Mela Maxi, Andrei Vespremier, who was a director of the Academy, and Fischer Galatz, who was one of the main uh, um, funders, he was a philanthropist. And this document establishes this new permanent exhibition space and it sets out the various duties involved in running it. And Mela Maxi was bringing a capital of 100,000 Romanian lei, um, which was a great deal of money for the time. And she was uh, responsible for selecting the merchandise um, together with Vespremia. Uh, deciding on, um, and I quote, the choice of objects that will be ordered, bought or display. She was essentially the manager of the exhibition section, undertaking, as the contract puts it, all the duties of a good administrator and providing reports twice a month to the other partners. And across, uh, scribbled across the page, you can even see a non-compete clause um, stating that she must not engage in a similar business venture for one year should she decide to leave the partnership. Um, so she was obviously thought of as being you know, serious competition. And there is additional proof of her position uh, from the letterhead paper that was designed by Vice Premier for the Academy, where you can see uh, it's written under the leadership of Mrs. A. Brun Maxi. There is a small number of images um, that allows us to see what the exhibition spaces of the Academy actually look like. We can see how they were arranged to resemble functional living areas. And there are some discrete labels next to the objects that indicate that the seemingly private space is, is for public consumption, but they are not very obvious uh, when you first look at the images. And in her memoirs, Liana Maxi, the daughter of, of Mela and MH, described her mother making the final preparations for the opening, which took place on the 23rd of October, 1926. After taking one last look at the objects and making some final adjustments, Mela settled down in a modernist armchair to contemplate her handiwork. The next day, the doors opened to welcome art critics and collectors, the elegant ladies of Bucharest, journalists, writers, actors, and friends from all branches of the art. Mela's extensive network of artists and collectors was established through the weekly salon she hosted in the Maxi family home. In June 1930, the cover of the magazine UNU showed Mela and Maxi together in one vignette, part of a collage gathering together Bucharest avant-garde. One avant-garde writer um, later recalled Mela Maxi's, and I quote, interesting manner of provo provoking debate and inciting through dialectic controversies, discussions about current events. Another one recalled, and I quote, the literary club and artistic laboratory or even salon where I once had the honor of shaking the hand of Konstantin Brancusi in an ambience that fused Bohemia with learned discussion. The Academy's commercial space was highly influential despite its short life, appearing as we have seen on the cover of um, avant-garde magazines, hosting modern dance performances and being depicted also in fiction and on stage. Yet Mela's contribution was in large part invisible and has only become evident through some fortunate finds in a private collection and through piecing together fragments of other people's recollections. The lives of avant-garde women in particular fall not only outside the purview of avant-garde magazines, but often outside that of public archives and museum collections in my experience. And in the case of Dida Solomon and Mela Maxi, it is entirely possible that we will never know the full extent of their activities. And for the final part of this talk, I want to focus on the beginnings of the Academy of Decorative Arts, uh, which I had much more success in recovering. Um, and this is a case study that really highlights, I think, the perils of focusing only on the narratives told through the avant-garde periodicals. Um, like I said, the general consensus for a long time was that M.H. Maxi was the creator of the Academy, which he modeled on the Bauhaus after spending time in Germany in the early 1920s and visiting Weimar. 
Um, but this version of the, tour, of the story actually could not be further from the truth, as I found out. The Academy was in fact funded, uh, founded by a man I have already mentioned, Andrei Vespremia, who was a Hungarian Jew from Transylvania. In the early 1920s, around the same time that Maxi was in Berlin, so was Vespremia. He was attending an institution called the Schule de Reimann, the Reimann School. The Reimann offered a wide range of classes with the overall focus on modern commercial design and the ambition to provide students with the skills to work in business and industry. It was innovative in its curriculum and introduced classes for poster design in 1911, for theatre design in 1913, and for commercial art, including window display design in 1920. By the time uh, Vespremia was in attendance, the Reimann was a worthy competitor for the Bauhaus, having a long-standing collaboration with the Deutsche Verbund and attracting hundreds of students every year. Vespremia's report card from the Reimann has survived and I was able to track it down and to compare it with the Academy's curriculum and with the curriculum of the Bauhaus. Even the cursory comparison reveals the highly personal nature of the Academy's program. Most of the classes offered were in the disciplines that Vespremia had been trained in at the Reimann. Um, from his report card, we can see he was excellent at bookbinding, ivory carving, metalwork and ornament and that he achieved various levels of proficiency in drawing from life, color theory, modeling, poster design, etching, engraving, and typography. Um, many of these disciplines were part of the Academy's curriculum when it opened in 1924, and others were added during the 1926 expansion, with the most well-developed classes um, drawing on the premier strength in metalwork, bookbinding, and the graphic arts. So comparing the Academy's pedagogical offering with that of the Bauhaus, it is evident that the majority of disciplines do not coincide, especially when considering the curriculum available in Weimar in 1922, when Maxi would have visited. For example, the core Bauhaus workshops included ceramics, carpentry, glass, and more painting, none of which were offered at the Academy in 1924. Uh, by contrast, the Academy offered a course in typography and graphic lettering, something that was formally taught at the Bauhaus, was not formally taught at the Bauhaus until 1925, but had a long tradition as a discipline at the Reimann. Um, an academy course entitled The Architecture of Interior Design, introduced in 1926 and taught by the architect Marcel Yanko, preempted the architectural department at the Bauhaus by nearly a year. So whatever Maxi saw in Weimar in 1922 did not directly translate into the organization of the Academy of Decorative Arts. The evidence does not support the claim that he was the originator of this institution under the influence of the Bauhaus. Not only that, but it seems that the objects produced in the workshops of the Academy were also linked to Vespremia's time at the Reimann. Max's reputation as an innovator in Romanian applied arts is reliant on a number of objects that have survived and are currently in private or museum collections, and on images reproduced in avant-garde magazine, magazines. And um, having discovered um, quite a few interesting things, I, I had a hunch about this too, and I decided to take a look at the Reimann's own publications. And luckily for me, the Ryman had its own monthly magazine, which came out without fail for a period of almost 20 years. And the metal workshop was particularly well represented in the magazine. Um, I was able to identify several types of objects that appear in photographs of the Academy's exhibitions and to attribute them to Vespremia. So here we have um, uh, a type of object, uh, the sort of a bowl or a tray that with these, this kind of fanned out petal like uh, margins, um, which I found um, to have been produced in the, in the Raman workshops um, in 1921 and also in 1923. There, are, there is no artist um, assigned to these in the Raman magazine, but clearly whether this was the style of the workshop or whether it was Vespremia producing them. This is kind of how, how they, they arrived in Bucharest in 1926. Um, and so objects such as these, which are in museum collections in Romania, uh, some of them are signed by Maxi, but others are not. And they have um, all been attributed to Maxi, uh, which I think now clearly needs to be reconsidered. Um, and I do also believe that Vespremia actually taught Maxi how to make many of these objects because in 1926, um, Maxi is not mentioned um, either in reviews of the exhibition or in the catalog actually of the, of the exhibition itself as making this type of, of object. He was making mainly textiles and furniture. Um, and this is a second type of object. Um, 
I'm showing you only a few images. I mean, there are many more, but this, this second type I, I really like because I think it's a particularly beautiful open work and shows how skilled Vespermia was. Um, and this piece of jewelry, which is in the private collection was also thought to have been by, by Maxi in the past, but I think it's quite clear that um, it's, it's not. And uh, the biggest surprise was when I actually found a, a metal tray with Vespremia's own hallmark, um, also in a, in a collection in, in Romania, in Bucharest. Um, this is the house museum of a collector who was buying, well, buying or receiving perhaps as gifts, uh, many items from the Academy. Um, and this tray was also um, attributed to Maxi in the inventory of the museum, despite the fact that it has Vespremia's hallmark on it. So I have to ask, how did this happen? How did Vespremia and the Ryman get written out of the history of the Romanian avant-garde? One reason is that Vespremia's stay in Bucharest was relatively brief. He decided to relocate to Riga in 1927 for reasons that are as yet unclear. And um, many recently, uh, recent scholarly accounts give his nationality as Latvian. But in fact, he became a Latvian citizen only in 1934, having previously held Romanian citizenship um, and uh, Hungarian before that, before the First World War. Um, in, um, in Latvia, he was murdered in the Holocaust and he had no descendants. Um, and it was very moving actually to find his name written on the memorial wall, that, his name and that of his wife, uh, written on the memorial wall of the Riga Ghetto Museum when I visited in 2017. And this is when I also located material in Latvian archives that revealed his story and his contribution to the history of design. Uh, and these were documents he submitted over several years to obtain permission to work and to live in Latvia, uh, which were preserved in the state historical archives. And they, they tell really a fascinating story about his, his career. Um, and I should also say here that I had help in locating and translating these documents. And so I think, you know, transnational collaboration is really important in, in this respect in kind of helping us to uncover some of these strands that go beyond um, national narratives. Um, I suspect also that Vespermia's perceived foreignness, as it were, has contributed to his marginalization by scholarly narratives, both in Latvia and in Romania, when attempting to write the history of a so-called national avant-garde, as we often do. Um, another reason for Vespermia's marginalization is undoubtedly Maxi himself. In the mid-1920s, Maxi had his own applied arts venture, the Atelier Integral, as he called it, an extension of his periodical. And because um, Integral did not appear for a whole year, um, means that the fate of the Atelier is unclear, it simply disappears. And the first issue to appear after this hiatus in December 1926 heavily promotes the Academy of Decorative Arts, in which Maxi is now, was now involved. So the appearance, the disappearance of the Atelier Integral and the emergence of the Academy within the pages of the journal has led many scholars to suppose that they were a continuation of one another under the tutelage of Maxi, giving him credit for the wide ranging applied arts curriculum that this premier had in fact established two years earlier. Note how on the December 1926 cover of Integral, we have uh, this photo that I've shown you before of the Academy's showroom, which we now know uh, that the showroom itself was being managed by Mela Maxi. And also I can see there, there are objects there by Vespermia, and yet it is captioned modern interior by MH Maxi. As for the um, genealogy that involves the Bauhaus as the precursor of the Academy, uh, the Romanian art historian Irina Karabash has traced the origin of the Smith back to Maxi himself as well, suggesting that uh, his growing prominence later in life led him to overestimate, uh, so to speak, his youthful achievements. And for example, in a 1971 interview um, just before he died in the magazine Arta, Maxi recalled a supposed trip to the Bauhaus in Dessau that revealed to him and I quote, the possibilities of a modern decorative art emerging from the collaboration between artists and craftsmen. But of course, when he visited, uh, he would have gone to Weimar, not to Dessau. Um, and in all likelihood, and this is what Karabash also says, and this is what I also believe, that the link between uh, the Bauhaus and the Academy was made retrospectively. Because of course, by this time, the reputation of the Bauhaus made it the more desirable precursor of the Academy. 
Um, in this talk, I have highlighted some lesser known aspects of the rich artistic life of the avant-garde in Bucharest. And I hope these examples have shown the importance of widening our parameters as researchers in order to reveal untapped potential outside an already existing narrative. And whilst avant-garde publications are of course important sources of information, their inconsistent frequency and unreliable rhetoric means they cannot be relied upon to provide an accurate and coherent picture of the period. They may even contribute to errors that become self-perpetuating as we have seen. Furthermore, various segments of the history of international avant-garde may become obscured when we reduce our field of inquiry. This is how the contributions of women such as Dida Solomon and Mela Maxi have often gone unacknowledged. And transnational practitioners such as Andrei Vespremie and Jakob Sternberg have often been exiled to a scholarly no man's land. The existence of artistic practices and practitioners such as these situated outside current narratives of the avant-garde pose a challenge to the discipline and its established hierarchies. They also raise prom problems of a practical kind as materials are dispersed geographically and come in many different languages. But although more demanding in this respect, recovering such stories is a task worth undertaking and one that may well lead to a more inclusive and collaborative scholarly practice. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. This was this was wonderful, and um, also a treat for someone who who does not know much about uh, Romanian avant-garde and history of interwar um, art, uh, and I I guess for someone who is uh, really versed and uh, knows this um, a narrative that you tr are trying to uh, show. Uh, to deconstruct in a way to show actually what 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 it omits, um, and I really like that you um, you gave us this spec specter of of characters, so um, two male and two female uh, artists, uh, Stenberg, Dida Solomon, um, uh, Mela Maxi, and uh, Andrei Vespremie. Uh, for some of them, I've heard, but for for these two women, for example, I, I didn't know of. Um, and um, it is really interesting to to have um, um, to have that insight. I also like that you you went into this material research. It's almost an equivalent of, of what philologists do with texts, right? Uh, but you are also, which is very very important. You you are careful, uh, being aware that even material materials that you are looking uh, may contain errors themselves. Um, so thank you for that. I, I did really enjoy. Um, I guess we will have a lot of uh, questions and uh, I can ask Christopher if we have anything uh, in Q&A um, already from our audience or if you, Chris, have uh, some comment and question as well. We do have a, a couple of questions that came in in the Q&A uh, and one of them uh, overlaps very closely with the first question that I had. So, so maybe we'll go there first. Uh, the, the first one, I think, may be based on a bit of a misunderstanding. It, it, it's asking, how did Vespremia make it to Riga in 1944, uh, him being a Jew in the middle of the Nazi-occupied Europe, and, and how come he didn't end up in, in the concentration camps? Well, you, you answered he did end up in the camps, and in fact, he transitioned to, to Riga much earlier than that. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So he left Bucharest in 1927. Um, we don't really know why, and there is a very, it's kind of a very strange story. So there are these memoirs that the daughter of Ma Maxi, M.H. Maxi and Liana Maxi wrote, um, which she published in the 1980s before she died. Uh, I'm not actually sure. It was before she died that she published them not long before in the 1980s. And, and there she wrote something very strange. I mean, she was a fictional writer and she doesn't claim for this to be a, a true account. It's sort of a fictionalized memoir, as it were. Uh, but she claims that um, Vespremier had some um, kind of an unhappy marriage. He had some problems with his wife who was cheating on him and that he, <laughs> he, was, he wanted to actually perhaps um, even harm this man or kill this man. And that Mela Maxi stepped in and she, you know, kind of convinced him to let this go. And then eventually he decided to go to Latvia. Um, but what is interesting is that this is the first time that I could find that he is uh, described as being Latvian so the reason for why he goes back is because he has family there and he supposedly has, mm. this is where he has come from but I, I could find no um, evidence to, suge to suggest that he was he had family in Latvia I mean he wasn't he was born in in Kovasna in, in Transylvania 
Um, so it's very strange that actually this confusion about where he was from um, stems from this memoir that was published by the by Liana Maxi in the 1980s. Um, and then it was picked up by a number of scholars who thought that he was just somebody who was in Romania just very briefly for a couple of years and then he, he returned to his home country. Hmm. Um, yeah, so he arrived in 1927 and then he had a long and um, um, very successful career um, as, a, as a teacher in a number of Jewish um, schools in Latvia. And the reason that we know that he died, he died in the Kaiserwald concentration camp in 1943 or 44, is because one of his students who survived um, wrote um, that he had met his old teacher of Espermia in the camp and, and he saw him being beaten to death um, mm -hmm. one day by the guards. So yeah, so we know what happened to him from this as well. That's a remarkable story. Um, yeah. So as I said, a couple of the, the questions that came in uh, um, overlap with mine, which is about precisely the uh, the multilingual and, and inter-ethnic character of this avant-garde in, in Bucharest. And so, um, you know, one of the questions is in the form of were there tensions uh, among different ethnic groups within avant-garde, Romanians, Hungarians, Greeks, Jews, Slavs. Uh, and a, another question um, uh, refers to the, the French influence, uh, which is frequently discussed. Uh, did the Yiddish pre-World War II avant-garde influence uh, today's art and culture in Romania? So I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on uh, how, how, uh, how much of a, a, an interlingual and inter-ethnic community this was. Hold on. You may be muted. Sorry, I think sorry. I was muted. Yes. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was just saying this is like a, a quite a, a complex topic, and there is a, um, a theory that um, most avant-garde artists were not ethnic Romanians because they were they felt that they were excluded in a way from a particular national narrative. Um, so because um, after the unification uh, in nineteen after the First World War, so Romania became much bigger country in terms of territory and I don't know how to put this in a nice way um, uh, um, in terms of territory but also in terms of population and almost uh, one in three people were not ethnic Romanians anymore and this was a big concern for for the authorities for the for the government and what happened was that there was um, kind of a very pointed effort to to ensure that art and, and culture and architecture were kind of building this Romanian national narrative now. So they were trying to create um, a culture, a Romanian, a purely Romanian culture, as it were. And so this, um, what happened was that, uh, I guess the, the artists who, who were not ethnic Romanians, they could not really, um, they felt they could not really contribute. They were not they were not even wanted, perhaps they were not really invited to contribute to this because it was considered as something that only uh, somebody who was a, you know, a local uh, kind of, who was in, in tune with this orthodox kind of peasant roots of a Romanianist who could produce this art. So of course, if somebody was, was Jewish, how could they produce this art? So um, many of the avant-garde artists, therefore, they um, created their own their own groups, their own artistic groups, and they created kind of their own environments and their own way of producing art. And uh, they had these, also these periodicals um, through which they could um, interact. Um, so, sorry, but where am I going? Ethnic tensions. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <but> yes. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you a very potted story of Romania in the 1920s. Um, so I think, um, yes, yeah, so many of the avant-garde artists were in fact, um, the majority of them I think were, were Jewish. So there were no tensions, so to speak, in terms of ethnicity among the avant-garde. Um, there were some tensions in terms of what they believed or what sort of affiliations they had. For example, in the 1930s, there was a younger group um, who were, um, in touch with uh, kind of surrealism and, and Andre Breton. Um, and for example, when Marinetti came to visit Romania um, in the early 1930s, this, there was a, a break in between these two groups. Obviously the group who was more on the kind of communist um, side, they, they didn't, they thought that it was disgraceful that other group from the avant-garde had um, met him and they um, 
um, gave him kind of a you know a tour and they had dinner with him and all this so this is where there was like a big rift in between groups of the avant-garde but it was not to do with ethnicity this was to do with um, various like political beliefs and and also there were some some splits that happened because of artistic um, differences as well between um, different groups and in terms of the Yiddish influence uh, in today's today's art and culture in Romania um, well this is kind of what I'm trying to uncover like I think there is a lot more than than is really discussed um, and of course we still have a Yiddish language theater here in Bucharest which I think is one of the very few to 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 have um, to be still performing at least in Europe I don't I think maybe there is one one other one um, so I I really think there was a very big influence in terms of the Yiddish theater movement and it's a shame that it doesn't get spoken about more so I'm kind of trying to to work on that and to to bring it to the fore that's great um so let me come on with another question um oops just moved down uh this is fascinating thank you I love the material um about the links between Bucharest, Vilnius, and Riga, not just Paris. I wonder whether the dolls by Solomon could in fact be puppets. Oh, uh, yes, maybe they could be puppets. Uh, the, mm, there is no, there are no pictures that I know of, um, but it would be great to find something, <laughs> to find something more about this. Um, the word in Romanian is papush, so they could be puppets or they could be dolls, uh, but it's hard to know, it's just, just from this, um, yeah. So. Speculation. Okay, uh, uh, Megan Forbes, who, who will be talking for us uh, in March, uh, uh, says thanks for introducing so many figures uh, within the Romanian avant-garde. Uh, oops. Um, uh, they have not received careful scholarship in the past. You close by referencing uh, the stakes of this kind of research, uh, the challenges posed by gaps in the archive in retracing these histories and the need for collaborative research uh, moving forwards. Since there are many of us here, presumably, uh, who are engaged in research uh, of the avant-garde in interwar Central Europe, I was wondering if you could comment on how you suggest facilitating these dialogues and, and what role institutions need to play in this work, uh, especially relevant in time of increasing economic instability and job precarity uh, for young scholars in the humanities. So it's a pretty big ask from Megan, but what, what do you have for us? To try and solve the world's problems. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's um, no, I've spoken to Megan about this before, and I really appreciate actually being at the Law Center where there are several of us work in, within the Eastern European and um, in the region. Um, because I it was fairly isolating doing my PhD at St Andrews in some respects. I mean, I had some lovely colleagues who are also working on Romania and the Baltics, um, as well, but overall, like in general. There were not that many scholars that I could connect with, um, I felt, who were working on, um, on the region. But then um, I was lucky enough to, uh, to be invited to join a number of, of projects. Um, and it was really wonderful to have these connections. So one is to do with the theatrical avant-garde of Central and Eastern Europe. And this is a project that's been ongoing for a while and will result in a, in a book. Um, mm -hmm sort of an encyclopedia of avant-garde theater in, in Eastern and, and Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and there is another wonderful project at the New Europe College here in Bucharest, where we meet and we talk periodically about these issues of um, like art history and, and theory um, in connection to peripheral regions such as ours. And this is, again, it's a group of scholars from, from various regions, uh, from various um, countries in the region. So initiatives like this, I think, are really important. Um, and I hope that they, there are more, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> and that they invite us precarious scholars to yeah. <laughs> join them. <laughs> uh, Jesse Laboff, uh, uh, checking in, great talk. Completely agree that relying only on journals to tell the story of the avant-garde um, is not a good idea. <laughs> My question is what other sources you would recommend we use to complement journals? Exhibitions are a wonderful and rich counterpoint uh, but maybe just as highly selective and misleading as journals can be. Would you point towards specific kinds of archival records to fill in the gaps, business transactions, legal appeals, uh, as you have used? Um, yes, so I would say I'm a big fan of the, the press uh, more generally, like sort of, you know, other publications, not just avant-garde periodicals. 
Um, so I, I looked a lot at the cultural press or at the daily, daily newspapers in Romania as well. Um, and more recently, I'm also looking for my current project at trade journals. Um, and for example, I found out that Maxi was um, also writing articles for um, a trade journal about, he was very interested in ideas around advertising uh, and commercial display as well. He had kind of a sideline. Um, going in that and he was writing for other publications and this is a scholar who works on um, on com on the history of, of business and commerce basically told me about this <laughs> so I then went and looked at this publication and it was absolutely fascinating because I normally you know as an art historian I, I probably I might not have come across this if I was working within the very kind of traditional parameters of the discipline um, so yeah so I would say just looking at various uh, other newspapers and periodicals other than the avant-garde ones but also obviously archives and again um, because of my current project I'm going more into this sort of um, history of uh, I don't know what to call it the, the way in which the avant-garde crossed over with the history of commerce and business as well in Bucharest in the 1920s which is sounds strange I know but you know <laughs> we'll get there we'll do another talk about that at some point um, and so I've, I've become much more aware of the importance of, of records, um, archival records that look at, for example, you know, businesses being registered, like the Academy of Decorative Arts, for example, would have been registered as a business um, somewhere. So that's something that I would like to pursue. <laughs> but I, I, because everything has been closed, I haven't been able to. But it's just sort of, you know, like thinking very differently about where we can find the information about these things, I think is, is interesting and a learning curve for me, for sure. Outside the box, there are, I guess, a lot of places, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeremy Howard says, great talk, many thanks. Uh, the Levendal designs for Gogol's marriage had text in Russian, uh, both descriptive for the costumes and within the actual sets, like shop signs. Uh, can you tell us more about the surviving designs and perhaps about Levendal? Sure. Jeremy is my uh, PhD supervisor and he made me go to Latvia. So like, you know, many thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, otherwise I would not have found any of this great material. Um, about Lovendal, um, he's very interesting. I would like to look more at him in the future. Um, and there is um, a really great archive of his works because uh, he had family, he had descendants, he had family who were really kind of careful at looking after his heritage. So there is a family foundation who, who owns a whole lot of um, designs and, and paintings and um, uh, theater sets and so on. I think it's interesting that he has also been, sometimes when he's been exhibited, he did a whole bunch of portraits of peasants from Bukovina, I think, or something mm. like that. So he had this uh, very, very different aspect of his, of his artwork. And this often gets pushed to the forefront and his more experimental work doesn't really get discussed so much. So again, you know, there is this divide, I think, between what's avant-garde and, and what's not avant-garde and uh, drawn alongside lines of ethnic um, ethnicities, I think. So also breaking out of our box a little bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Irena uh, Levezanu says, I really like your focus on marginalized figures and processes in uh, the Romanian avant-garde, a field that was itself marginalized for decades. You point to Maxi as bearing some of the responsibility for this. Uh, he was good at adjusting to the communist regime, uh, but scholarship also marginalizes these figures. Uh, in the case of Sternberg, is the fact that he went to the Soviet Union uh, uh, account for marginalization at all? Um, yes, I would guess so. I mean, even in just in the sense that there is no archive that I know of, like personal archive that I could find. Uh, also because he was sent to a labor camp at one point um, and then he died after he, he emerged from there, he, he died at one um, But... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I would have expected him maybe to to have been more prominent during the communist period, perhaps because he went to the Soviet Union. Um, right. In some, he doesn't seem to be. He seems to have been um, kind of forgotten almost in in, um, in terms of theatrical scholarship. And I was just um, in touch with some. Um, of the faculty from the, the theater, um, the theater department of the university in Bucharest, here in Bucharest. And 
they were also kind of very surprised to find out more about him and they thought that he could really be an inspiration for students of theater <laughs> at present in the present day so I was very excited about that and I hope something comes of that yeah, we can bring them back good archaeology um uh, Christopher Medalis uh, asks if you have found any connection between Mela Maxi and other women avant-garde figures you mentioned uh, with the notable group of uh, women modernist architects working in Romania during the 20s, such as uh, Henrietta uh, de la Vrancia and Maria Vrancia. Cotescu. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I haven't. Um, I have found very little about her um, in general. And it was really very lucky that I found some of these documents because um, somebody basically went to visit Liana Maxi before she died and they managed to acquire a number of things from the family. Um, and these have been preserved and everything else apparently was thrown out or, or has disappeared. It's, it's unclear what happened to the, um, a whole load of, sort of documents and, and items that would have been in possession of the family. And so Mela is pretty much absent from, from the archives and because um, M.H. Maxi was a director of the Romanian National Art Museum. He has left some stuff in the archives of the, that institution that he wanted to be found, presumably. <laughs> but she died um, in the 1940s. So, yeah, it's, um, it's kind of a bit frustrating because I, I cannot tell her full story at the moment with, with what I have, but who knows. Uh, Jesse Lapov is back to ask a question I also wanted to ask, which is, when is the Central European Avant-Garde Theater book coming out? And could you point, uh, post a link to that project in the chat, maybe? Um, I will try to. It's the uh, Zbigniew Rozniewski Institute in Poland, uh, okay. in, yes, in Warsaw, who are the lead on this, and they have some funding, and they're, they're trying to put this together. And I think the book is due out next year. So I'm supposed to be writing it now, but I was preparing for this presentation, so I'm going to do <laughs> uh, Serving two masters, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for that, uh, for that project. I think it's going to be great. It's, it sounds really exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, Eva Forgac says, thank you for a very rich and interesting talk. My question is how um, uh, important ties did the Romanian avant-garde have to their Hungarian counterparts during the 20s and 30s? Uh, apart from a few publications, were there personal contacts with Kasak and, and his circle? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't really know. I haven't really looked into that so much. Um, I did at one point, I was curious to see how much of a uh, presence that other Central and Eastern European artists had in the Romanian periodical. So I, I, I counted actually all the, all the artworks that were uh, printed in the different periodicals. And I was disappointed to find that not many from the Central and Eastern European region were reproduced and that they were mainly kind of, well, their own, the Romanian avant-garde artworks and also Western ones. Um, uh, but uh, Lajos Kashak, for example, I know he was, there was a cover, I think, with one of his artworks. So clearly there would have been some correspondence involved if they, they printed his artwork on the cover. But yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know there is a lot of discussion about networks and how people were connected during that time. But I, I worry that uh, maybe much like today, um, perhaps we are not sufficiently connected to our own <laughs> neighboring <laughs> kind of countries. Um, and this at least is just the evidence that I have found, but I have not really properly looked in, in the archives to, to, for, this kind of, for this kind of connections. A follow-up question to that. Um, uh, do you know if they had any knowledge of Sandor uh, Bortnik's Budapest Bauhaus school? Oh, that's a good question. They might have. I would have to look into that. Thank you, Eva. Yeah. Uh, and let's see. Uh, question that came in, I guess, from YouTube. Uh, could you explain a bit where satirical publications and art fell in compared to the Romanian avant-garde of the time? I know that jokes and satire uh, in general are a big part of Romanian culture. Uh, again, this is not really my specialty. I know that there were um, the surrealist leaning kind of publications in the 1930s were more into that. Um, sort of um, register, I suppose, that tone. Um, there were a lot more kind of 
mm, satirical and maybe a little bit disruptive as well. They try to be. Um, whereas I don't think that the ones that the publications that I've been focusing on, such as Contemporano and Integral, um, were so much in that, yeah, took that tone so much. I think they were more kind of trying to establish the space for themselves um, to have a voice as a, as a um, an avant-garde, as a, as a Romanian avant-garde movement, as it were. So there were quite serious discussions <laughs> most of the time in these, in these magazines. It's a fascinating question, one I'm interested yeah. in as well, is, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of in the nature of avant-garde to take oneself very seriously. And I always do find it interesting when there is an explicit place for humor uh, within avant-garde. Uh, uh, so um, let's see. Uh, this is a question that we, we touched on a bit earlier, but do you have, if there was anything you had to add about uh, Yiddish culture merging into the avant-garde and maybe specifically Yiddish mm -hmm. culture in constructive, uh, I assume that means constructivist periodicals in Romania? Um, yeah, that's a really good question that I've also been kind of pondering. So I think as far as I can tell, Yiddish culture was very important in terms of performance, so in this um, theatrical aspect of the of the avant-garde, but it seems to have been, like I found, it seems to have sort of diverged a little bit from the mainstream avant-garde, mm -hmm. and I'm not quite sure why that was. I mean, the, the Yiddish performers were, most of them were traveling. Uh, the Vilna Tree, for example, was in Romania for, for a few years. I mean, they, they settled there for that period, but they had, you know, they came from somewhere else and then they, 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 they left. Um, and there were many other performers who were also um, itinerant. So this is actually one of the ways in which information traveled, I think, which is quite important and perhaps it's been a little bit neglected as well, even more than the periodicals, um, because um, these, um, itinerant performers they saw a whole host of artistic practices in various places and they then kind of created their own interpretations of that um, but I think um, in terms of the constructivist periodicals I don't think there is so much and I was really wondering about this like why for example some of these performances which are very very interesting very experimental and arguably more avant-garde than what the avant-garde was producing why they are not mentioned <laughs> Yeah. Why they are not mentioned in the periodicals, um, and the only reason that I could come up with is maybe that they were, um, it was uh, to do with a professional rivalry, so maybe they were, mm. they were seen as a threat, like they maybe they were too avant-garde for their own good. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is this is a great question. Thank you. That that's an interesting hypothesis yeah. about yeah these gaps that we have in the record. It's it's probably <laughs> one we should consider. Um, really, yeah, there were some collaborations, but not. Um, they did. They didn't seem to be part of the same kind of the same world or the same kind of cult, the same groups. Really, the same artistic groups. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one request uh, earlier on. Uh, any more stories you can share about Vespremia in Latvia? Um, so. I just um, know what he did from these uh, from these files that he that were left in the archives. This is when he was applying for a permit to live in Latvia and also to work in Latvia, um, which um, I think is, is again is quite interesting into how how this information survives, you know, and and you know this. I, quite um, awful like bureaucracy where somebody is forced to you know explain everything about their life in order to their lives in order to get access to to live in a particular country uh, <laughs> there is also a silver lining in a sense I suppose I don't know <laughs> but uh, he it was a little bit frustrating because he describes um, his activities and and he also says that he's attaching some some pictures and exhibition catalogs but these are not in the archives anymore so obviously some very zealous um, bureaucrats <laughs> threw them out. <laughs> uh, it's very upsetting. Yeah, that's frustrating. <laughs> yes. So he was there when, when he was there, he was mainly involved in teaching. So he, he was supposed to have been a very good, yeah, a very good pedagogue. And he, he did a number of courses as well um, in pedagogy um, and in teaching and sort of methods for teaching the applied arts as well. And there was a lovely quote that I found um, in a reference from one of the schools where he worked, where they said that, well, you know, like he's very good at teaching like the good students, but also like the really bad ones as well, like he has a way with them. So he makes them, <laughs> he makes them better. 
which I thought was very nice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, I suspect that he, he was much more instrumental for the applied arts in Romania than, than we know of because he produced, I mean, I found a whole host of objects, both metal objects and book bindings and, mm. and all sorts of other things that I think he may have produced or he may have shown people how to make them. Um, because he was supposed to be to, to be very skilled at making, so he was he was a craftsman more than than anything I think, and and also he was very good at um, teaching as well, like we have seen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think he's a very fascinating figure, and and it's really a shame that what we have about him are um, sort of quite dry documentation that doesn't really tell us, you know, what his experiences were and and what really happened, what determined him to leave Bucharest as well, uh, for example, which would be interesting to find out still unsolved mysteries right yes. um uh one request can you give any tips of names for contemporary uh romanian avant-garde artists now oh gosh that's uh don't really want to say i don't know i feel like you'll be giving people an unfair advantage seeing as i know some of them personally <laughs> well you know <laughs> a little, this, bit, a little bit of fun advertising <laughs> Yeah. A little bit of advertising. I leave that to my more qualified colleagues who uh, work in the contemporary arts section. Very well. <laughs> well, I think we've pretty much made through the the, the questions here. Uh, Sasha, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask also a question. Uh, I, I think it's great that we have an audience that, it, that was carefully listening and it's really engaging. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, my question is uh, about the, a little bit of social background of these two female artists that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Mela Maxi was running a business with this Academy of Decorative <laughs> Arts, while Dida Solomon, as you mentioned, um, was in more like precarious financial situation with her theater. Can you say how this, this class background may have influenced these distortions in the narrative that you're addressing? Um, yeah, that's a good, a good point. Like, I, I don't know, um, again, I don't know that much about their, their families um, enough to, to be able to tell more about this. I mean, I don't really know where Mela had this money from. It is possible that she did have it from, from her family. I know that she worked, um, she seems to have also worked when she was in Berlin. So when Maxi and Mela, they traveled to Berlin in the 1920s, like I said. And I read somewhere that she was also working there and she was basically supporting um, Maxi by working as a translator or something like that for some kind of like German and Romanian import export company. Um, and yeah, it's really a shame that we don't, we don't know more about these professional um, career paths that women had at the time and how they, meant, how they got into them as well. And in terms of Pida Solomon, I think perhaps being financially precarious, I, I don't think she was necessarily of like a lower kind of class. I think in her memoirs, she basically says that she was, she had uh, quite a, a big family and it was very difficult to become a, an actor because uh, her, her sister, for example, was working in an office as a, um, um, I think she was like a secretary or something, but she was working in, a, in the office of a, of a newspaper, of a Romanian newspaper. And this is where she met a lot of the um, kind of cultural figures of the period and that her sister paid for her to have um, lessons at the conservatoire in, in Bucharest. Um, so this is what I know about uh, Dida Solomon. And I think, you know, the fact that the, the theater had financial issues is more because they didn't manage to, to find an audience because it was too um, experimental. Experiment. I see. For the time, yes. <laughs> and you also mentioned the, about George Blumenthal. He's he wanted. You said something about socialism or his engagement with um, socialist ideas. But then you said, yeah, we can address that later. About, Sorry. Yeah, Sternberg. Yeah, yeah. No, I, but I find very interesting with Sternberg is the fact that. Um, Okay, so there is this theory that basically that the Romanian avant-garde was not political enough. So you will often read this in accounts of, of the avant-garde where people complain that they were, they called uh, an aesthetic avant-garde or that they were only kind of looking inwards at their own artistic practices. Um, and, uh, and yet at the same time, you know, nobody uh, is talking about Sternberg. He was the most politically engaged of everybody. <laughs> and he... Um, 
was always um, very much attached to kind of communist ideas. He participated in some organizations. I mean, these ones were not allowed, uh, were illegal at one point in, in Romania. So he was kind of, this was all underground. Um, but he did very explicitly say that um, some of the productions that he was putting on, they had a political agenda and his, his um, goal was to campaign for civil rights for the Jewish population in, in Romania. He created this kind of strange um, uh, mix of, of musical cabaret and, and political activism, which he put on stage uh, even as early as like 1917 and 1918. And then um, the two productions that I looked into, which were in the 1930s together with Maxi, um, which were um, from the program, it's, it's quite evident that they are kind of addressing the concern of the, um, the rise of the Nazi regime. So there is a production from 1933 um, where they have some musical numbers that are about, you know, about Hitler and so on. So, so he was very much in tune with, with what's yeah. happening and he was trying to raise awareness of, of, of the things that were, were going on. Um, so, yeah, so I... I think that's again that's another area that should be researched more and uh, discussed it's, it's very rich and it's fascinating thank you so much it's really wonderful and and thank you for bearing with us so late into the evening in in europe <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. thank you thank you for inviting me yes well um yeah, I, I think that we, we reached the, the limit with, with the time as well. And then our audience is obviously um, was with us all this time. So thank you everyone for listening. And thank you, Alexandra, for such a wonderful talk. Um, and I'm really looking forward to continue uh, this conversation. So we are meeting in two weeks. Uh, and uh, Chris, um, uh, should we just say a few words about our next uh, webinar? Um, yeah, so on March 16th, uh, we're going to have uh, Michalina uh, Kmietzik uh, speaking about Katarzyna Kobro and Deborah Vogel as uh, composers of space. Uh, so this is a scholar from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Uh, so uh, uh, more good stuff coming up on, on March 16th. Please join us. Yeah. Thank you and have a, have a nice <laughs> evening. Thank you so much for inviting me and for all the wonderful questions and engaging engagement from the audience. Yeah. <laughs> I hope, Alexander, we will have a chance to read about this also somewhere. I hope yeah. so. Sometime soon. <laughs> I will let you know. Thank you. Okay.